Um, just a few words about Dr. Reverby before I bring her up. She is the Marion Butler McLean Professor in the History of Ideas and Professor of Women's, Women's and Gender Studies at Wellesley College and a historian of American women, medicine, and nursing. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree from Cornell in industrial and labor relations with a focus on labor and economic history. She has an MA from NYU and a PhD from BU in American Studies. She's also worked as a community organizer in New York and as a women's health activist. She spent three years as a health policy analyst in the Health Policy Advisory Center in New York in the early 1970s, focusing on women's health and nursing issues. Um, she's also served as a consumer representative on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Obstetrics and Gynecology Devices Advisory Panel and served on the board of directors of the ACLU of Massachusetts. Um, I say that all to, um, as a way to say, uh, Dr. Everby has her feet firmly planted in both the historical world and in the public health world. Um, and I think you see that reflected in her work, um, which all of my students, uh, many of whom are sitting in this audience, uh, have read for our history of public health class. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Susan Reverby. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you, and thank you for coming. I have a—I just started to have a really bad cold, so if I start expiring up here, I apologize or coughing um, madly. So I um, want to talk a little bit about the problems of how we think about research. So for those of you who watch, anybody watch? Grey's Anatomy, how many of you guys, okay. So do you remember the end of last season? Dr. McDreamy here and uh, Dr. Uh, Gray have an argument over the fact that there was a double-blinded research study that he's running on, for an Alzheimer's drug and she breaks the code for it to treat um, a woman named Adele who's the wife of their, um, their chief of medicine and the chief of surgery, and she, he says to her, how could you do this? And she says to him, but it was Adele. And it captured, I thought, in public, and he said, but we could have helped millions of people. Now the FDA is closing our trial because you broke the code. So it, I thought it did a good job of bringing up in public the kinds of concerns we have, which is to whom do you owe your, um, responsibility? Do you owe it to the subjects and to the future when you do medical research? Or what about the individual person who's sitting in front of you? How do we think about what's ethical and what's not. So um, I want to start by talking a little bit about these two sexually transmitted diseases. And I put this um, slide up, which is on the crude mortality rates for both syphilis and AIDS um, in the first half of the, in, during the 20th century, because it gives you, I think, a really nice sense about how serious syphilis was. If you can see, before penicillin comes in, the death rates are higher than they were for AIDS before um, before AZT and before the antiretrovirals, and it gives you some sense of the importance of this disease in American um, culture. So these are posters from um, the 1930s um, where people are beginning to begin to talk publicly about syphilis. This is a period in which the Surgeon General, Thomas Perrin, is actually not allowed to speak about syphilis on the CBS radio because it's not supposed to be talked about in public. But the Public Health Service is making this huge effort to get information about it out. So there's this focus on syphilis in part because it really was a crucial um, public health concern. The famous um, um, Dr. William Ozer once said, he who knows um, syphilis knows medicine because it could affect all the organs of the body. Um, but there wasn't a lot of knowledge of the natural history of the disease and there was an assumption that the disease um, affected blacks and whites differently. And even after penicillin proves a cure in the 1940s, in the mid-1940s, there's still much that's not known about how penicillin works and where it would be appropriate. So the Public Health Service, I'm sure those of you who are in Dr. Udell's class know this because you've read my book. I just want to say a few things briefly about the Tuskegee study as a precursor to what I'm going to talk about in terms of Guatemala. So the Tuskegee study starts in 1932, as I'm sure most of you know. It's called formally the study of untreated syphilis in the male Negro. It's all African-American men who have the disease. One of the key ideas about Tuskegee that floats through the American culture is the idea that the men were given the disease by the public health service, but in fact, all of them were supposed to be in late latency, that is not still contagious, although a number of them still were. The key elements in the study and the reason most of us know about it, because if you've done any IRB training, you know for sure you had to pass 
part of your test was about it, was that the study was completely deceptive. The men were told they were being treated for their bad blood and that the aspirins, tonics, and diagnostic spinal taps were in fact treatments. There was no consenting in the study except for the autopsies. And the study um, used, um, the come on was both private, um, the uses of what I call a private public health nurse who took care of the men and their families and the promise of burial insurance. And even after penicillin, the study goes on, even after ethics questions are raised in the 40s and 50s, it doesn't end until 1972, formerly 73, when um, the story um, goes out on the AP wire because one of the men involved, who was an STD investigator, was so angry about it that he finally gave the story to an AP reporter. And that's how the study you know, breaks out and ends. So this is a photograph taken by the Public Health Service in the mid-50s. Um, this is Eunice Rivers Lori. For those of you who have seen the film Miss Evers Boys, which is the fictionalization of the study, Nurse Rivers was the go between the men in the Public Health Service. And this is her handing out a packet of aspirins to one of the men in the study where they're claiming that this is a cure for syphilis. This is a picture of one of the spinal taps in the study where the men were told that it was a special treatment for their bad blood rather than a diagnostic procedure. So we know now, despite the rumors that not all the men, people don't, not everybody dies from syphilis. It's a disease people can die uh, with, not from. But other people had horrific um, cardiovascular or neurological. Um, complications from the disease, but we, th at least from judging from the medical records which are now available, um, that at least 12 of them certainly died from syphilis, if not others. Um, not all the men, the study was meant to be obviously the title is Untreated Syphilis in the Male Negro, so the idea was of course to keep the men from treatment, but what happens, it's clear from their records that by the 50s and 60s, some of them are part of the great migration out of the rural south, they get to other doctors. If any of you are, and some of you are in the room, old enough to remember the 50s before we understood a lot about um, what happens to bacteria that get fed penicillin all the time. Um, most of us, if we sneezed, got a penicillin shot from that period. So a lot of the men got to some kind of treatment just by hit or miss. Um, we know at the end that um, 22 wives, 17 children, and two grandchildren of the men tested positive for syphilis. Um, we don't know, of course, where they got the disease, but the public health service in, um, decided that it had to be from their, they weren't going to test it, so they basically, and they couldn't, they just made the assumption that they came from their husband's fathers or grandfather. And the study itself is what political scientists call a condensed symbol, that is, it's become this one word epithet to explain racism in American health care and to be used is an explanation for why African Americans often do not participate in clinical trials, even though the research basically shows that Tuskegee is not the reason that that happens. But it's a word that I think gets used as a kind of shorthand to explain all the other kinds of issues that come up in the healthcare system and around research. So the problem with the way the story often gets told in all of this, both this and the story in Guatemala, is what I would call these sort of melodramatic stories in which as you think about all the early horror films, the idea of the sort of sex, sometimes sexually crazed, you know, but crazy doc off on his island somewhere is part of the trope that we think of all the time in American um, melodrama drama going back to the cabinet of Dr. Kilgari in 1920, to the island of Lost Souls in the 1930s, and of course to Frankenstein. So I was really struck by this comment by Sidney Lumet, the late film director, and I was trying to think about the frame for my work. And he argues in a well-written drama, and I would argue in a well-written history, the story comes out of the characters. In that sense, you want to go find what happened to these people historically or the characters if you're writing a novel or a play or a movie. And then you create the story out of what happened in their lives. Um, but in melodrama, the characters, we already know who they are. So, you know, it's going to be snidely whiplash or Dudley do-right. And we already sort of know who the characters are. And the story is very melodramatic. We know all the details. And I was struggling to find, for the Tuskegee book in particular, a way to get away from sort of spectacle and tragedy in the study and to talk about what really happened to people. So part of the problem is the way the story gets told. Like Mr. Shaw here, who was the spokesman for the men, in, um, at the final apology, we got an apology from the United States government for the study in 1997. That's obviously the back of Bill Clinton's head, and this was on the front page of the New York Times. And Mr. Shaw comes up as a kind of poster man for the worst things that happened in the study because he, in the late 40s, the Public Health Service started some um, 
uh, clinics, rapid treatment clinics where people could get treated much more quickly for syphilis. And he goes up to one in Birmingham, 140 miles from Tuskegee, and he's called out of the line when he's up there and they say, you're not supposed to be here, and they send him home. So when you read it and when you hear it in the play, for example, Mr. Shaw becomes kind of like a runaway slave almost that's escaped his medical imprisonment in Tuskegee. He gets to, you know, over the Mason-Dixon line, as it were, into Birmingham, and then he gets turned away again. And so our horror over what happened in the study is really enormous. Except it turns out that people were turned away at this rapid treatment center because nobody who was assumed to be in late latency, which is what he was supposed to be in, would have been treated. At that time, they were only, it was a public health effort. They were only treating because te there was not enough drugs, people who were contagious still. So does Mr. Shaw get turned away because he's in the study and then they know that he's presumably in late latency and the story's a bit more complicated. And the other things that happen is Mr. Shaw got pneumonia in the 1950s and he ends up in the local hospital for 10 days where he gets IV penicillin for the whole 10 days. So, you know, the question is, is he symbolic of the study? Which story do we use him for? So this is a picture. The front row is three of the men who were um, in the study. If, those of you who've read Jim Jones's book, Bad Blood, which is the other book on the study. Let's see if I can get this to work. Hold on. No. OK, well, that's Jones in the back row there with the little mustache. Um, so this was the apology in the East Room. This is five of the six men who were still alive in um, 1997 when we got the apology. Um, all of the men have now passed um, by 2004, and all of their wives died by 2009. So if you're interested in this, I have an edited book that's sort of primary documents and articles about the study, and then my book that came out in 2009 is about both the study and how it travels into American culture. So one of the ways that the story travels, and the rumor that's the most enormous, is the one that the men were given syphilis by the government. And I've argued, um, almost starting 10 or 11 years ago now, that the story, I think, is more racist because the men were denied treatment. Not Because if they were just given it, then we can think about the docs who did it as part of this sort of tr traditional trope of the horror movie of the terrible infecting um, doctor. But this is a case in which people, much more normative, people were watched for 40 years through the 30s and the Depression, through the 40s, the invention of penicillin, of the realization that penicillin would work into the 50s as the Montgomery bus boycott starts in uh, Montgomery, 40 miles from Tuskegee, um, into the 60s the civil rights movement hits Tuskegee and doesn't end until the 70s. So it's pretty amazing to think that it continued. And the story is essentially told that this is a picture of um, infecting. So the, it looks, I mean, you, those of you who help people can see that the doctor's hand is pulling the syringe back. But most people who see this, what you see is a brown, a black arm and a white hand. And the assumption is made that the men are being infected or in this picture where Nurse Rivers is doing a blood draw. So that's kind of the background. I was working on the history of this when I found these papers about this study in Guatemala. <coughs> 40s. It's right after the war. The question of whether or not you can find a better prophylaxis for syphilis in particular is really important to the Army. So you can imagine lots of people in the Army and the Navy and the Armed Forces go out on shore leave or the equivalent. They have unprotected sex with sex workers. They come back, they get sick. So the government, and those of you who have grandparents who might remember, grandfathers who might remember the Second World War, will tell you that everybody was given these things called pro-kits. This is one of them. I actually bought it on eBay. And it was made um, mostly out of calomel and other um, ingredients. And you, the men were supposed to rub it on their penises after they got back um, from unprotected sex. And the idea was that it would kill the spirochete. So even if they had been exposed, they wouldn't get the infection. So the question was, what can we use for prophylaxis for syphilis? Could we use penicillin, which was the new drug then, or a compound called Orvis um, mafarsin? So that's what's going on. And so during the war, there's actually a study on gonorrhea that's done at the Terre Haute Federal Penitentiary. This is a period in which we're using prisoners a lot for our research. And in this study, they asked for permission, although you can argue, or I certainly would argue, that it's a little hard to get permission from prisoners because the men were told that if they agreed to this, they would get more money put in them, you know, this to get more food, they could get cigarettes, they could get a letter to their parole board. So they agree to the study in which they are essentially infected with um, gonorrhea and then an attempt is made to try to um, 
uh, cure them if they get infected, but the study doesn't work very well. Um, the STDs are not, syphilis isn't, the gonorrhea isn't really, um, they don't get infected enough, and so the study goes away. But this issue of testing and trying to figure out a prophylaxis stays within the public health service. And again, remember, it's a sexually transmitted disease, so how are you going to do the research? What's the vector going to be? So what happens is this study begins in Guatemala in 1946. <laughs> There's a grant given by the NIH um, to the Public Health Service in conjunction with the Pan American Sanitary Bureau or the PAHO, what's now called the Pan American Health Organization, with the VD Lab um, in Staten Island of the U.S. Public Health Service. There's cooperation with all of these agencies within Guatemala. And the director is a man named John C. Cutler, who's a senior surgeon in the Public Health Service, and his contact in Guatemala is a man named Juan Funes, who had been trained by the VD Lab. And my guess is, I have no evidence for this, but my guess is that Cutler, Onsley, and Funes went out for a beer one day in Staten Island. And Cutler had been involved in the Terre Haute study, and I think he literally said to Funes, you know, here's the problem. Funes says, ah, I have the perfect place for us to do this um, study. So this is the uh, syphilis section from NIH that agreed that this study could go forward. And this is what Cutler looks like. So that's what he looks like on the left when he's 31 years old. So he's only four years out of medical school when he goes to Guatemala, which I think is really interesting. And that's his picture where most of us know him because if you've seen any of the documentary films that have been made about the Tuskegee study, Cutler also worked in a, in a sort of administrative position in Tuskegee after the Guatemala study in the 50s. So when the films were being made in, 19, in 1992, so this is 20 years after the Tuskegee study ends, Cutler's one of the central figures in these films because he's one of the few docs who's still alive and who's willing to talk. And he basically on the film says, it was great. We did a really good research study. It was really important. These people were doing the right thing for their race. And here it is. It's 20 years after Tuskegee. It would have been really easy on some level for him to say, you know, we shouldn't have done it. It was a different time. We think differently about these things, but he doesn't. And one of the reasons that most of us, the group of historians that started the organizing for the um, apology from Clinton was because we were so angry at Cutler. So I was, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but I was in the archives in Pittsburgh to look at the Thomas Pair and the Surgeon General's papers when I realized that Cutler had papers there and I thought I would find more about Tuskegee, but instead what was in the papers was all of this material about Guatemala. So here is now, remember I have now spent at this point probably 15 years of my life explaining that no one was um, infected by the government in Tuskegee and here is this paper that says experimental studies in human inoculation with syphilis, gonorrhea, and chancroid and Cutler writes at the beginning, these studies were designed to obtain information about methods of prophylaxis against syphilis to increase our understanding of, of uh, penicillin and a bunch of questions around the serologies themselves. So the question is, why is he in Guatemala? So think about it. You have to find a population with an infection that can be contained for study. There's this long history of this connection between the Public Health Service and the, and the Pan American Health Organization. In fact, the Surgeon Generals were the heads of PAHO until the 30s. Um, you can get to these populations, which they end up doing in Guatemala, commercial sex workers, prisoners, mental health patients, and soldiers. And you've got a vector. That is, here's the good news for them in terms of the research. Not only is prostitution legal in Guatemala, but bringing a sex worker into the prison to service a prisoner is also legal. So, that, so here we have people who can deliver the disease and we have a population you can give the disease to that you can contain and watch, which is why they do the study there. And as Cutler says very clearly in his report, this group lowest in the social scale of local prostitutes and most frequently infected would be permitted um, after we saw that they were diseased to continue going to the prison and were paid by us, your US taxpayer dollars, for offering their service to any man who desired to utilize her at no cost to himself. It sounds like one of those used car salesmen um, there. And in fact, they even gave them alcohol because Cutler was trying to recreate what he called normal exposure um, in the study. So you could imagine it was kind of, people were very willing to sign up for this um, and had no idea what was going on. So the methods of exposure, and I'll talk about the details in a minute, were both these sexual in intercourse, and then they later go on to making an inoculum and to delivering it through skin contact, direct injection, um, scarification and abrasion of people's penises and cervixes, and cisternal punctures. 
So what happens in the prison is even though they're giving free sex, essentially the men don't like it because they're also doing a lot of blood draws just to figure out who's getting infected. And if you think about it, they could, a lot of these people had never had blood draws before and they couldn't quite understand why all this blood was disappearing out of their body and they were being given iron pills to help with the possible anemia and they just didn't get it and so they were refusing um, to be involved. So they move on next to a, uh, and there's no real protocol written that's really clear. They keep making it up as they're going along, which is not untypical for research at this time. So they go on to an orphanage and they do not give anybody syphilis there. They mostly do studies there of the blood tests and they treat a couple of people. But then they move on to both an army barracks and to a national mental health um, hospital. And there they can't use the infected prostitutes because um, they're are men and women in the hospital and um, male doctors are not allowed to um, examine the women pretty easily and a decision is made instead to make the inoculum. So the VDRL in Staten Island mails them the rabbits which also can get syphilis. They kill the, ra the male rabbits, they grind up the testes and they make the inoculum which they then start um, transferring. So this is one of the photographs. Um, there's a whole series in these files of amazing photographs of all the people involved. The original photographs, the Public Health Service did this afterward, but did not have the faces blocked out. And all the pictures were taken by um, Elise Cutler, who was Dr. Cutler's wife and a, and a professionally trained photographer. The photographs are actually quite extraordinary. Um, and she's also a Wellesley College alumna, no less. It's pretty amazing. So when they go to the mental health hospital, it's pretty clear they don't tell them exactly what they're doing and they sort of bribe the director. And I found this quote, I think, more than any of the others, the most horrific because here they offer them Dilantin, which is a drug for epilepsy. A lot of the people in the hospital really weren't mentally ill. They had epilepsy, so they don't have enough drugs. They offer them a refrigerator for their biologics, a motion picture projector. But I found the most upsetting the idea of them giving metal plates, cups, and forks, which gives you a sense that in this hospital there wasn't even enough cutlery and plates to take care of it. So we're talking about a, a really, really under-resourced area in which people can be bribed fairly quickly for this um, without telling the director of the hospital exactly what they were doing. So this is, just to give you a sense of some of the numbers, this is a chart from the um, the Bioethics Commission that did some research on this afterward. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But the number to really look at is the one in the, let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, uh, okay, well, whatever. The right bottom thing is 1,308 people altogether, which is about the number of people we think were infected, although other studies have shown a different set of numbers. The records are really bad. And 678 were treated. What this chart, however, doesn't tell you is we don't know how many evinced infection. So we know how many people were exposed. We know how many people were treated. We don't know the middle number, which actually really matters, actually. So if you look at this, it looks horrific. But other research has suggested maybe about 14% of the people who were in the um, syphilis arm of the study didn't get any treatment that was proper. But other people did. So this is what one of the medical records um, looked like. So this says scarification penis, which is the way they were delivering the inoculum. They were using the Nichols strain of the disease. It's a Nichols rabbit. And what they would do is scarify the man's penis. They would drop the inoculum on a pledgelet. And this, the circles are mine, but you can see it went on for an hour and a half. Um, to try to pass the infection on. So the deception is really enormous here as it was in Tuskegee. The officials are not being told. And the correspondence back and forth between Perrin and Cutler suggests, as this mariologist named Robert Coatney writes to, Perrin, to Cutler and says, look, the Surgeon General says, you know, we couldn't do such research in the United States. And you can read that quote as meaning we couldn't do it in the US, so we had to go to the global south. Or it could really mean that we don't have prostitutes we can use in this way in the United States. So it's not clear exactly how to interpret this. And what's fascinating about this is the Tuskegee study was never done um, in a back room. That is, people knew about it. There were 13 articles published in medical journals. People were invited to come down and see it. This one, they're keeping much quieter. So R.C. Arnold. Um, who's supervising Cutler and was his close friend. Um, Arnold says to Cutler, look, I think this is kind of, I don't know about the politics of this. They can't really consent. And what if some goody organization finds out about it? He says, um, you know, maybe we have to do it 
quietly and not tell anybody about what's going on. So you get a very different story than Tuskegee, where there's much more openness about what they're up to. And they're also beginning a VD program at the military. They treat orphans. They um, help other people who have VD. So there's some other good stuff going on on the side. But the problem is, by 1948, the VD division is getting much less money because now we know that syphilis can be cured with one shot penicillin. There's much less interest in VD. The division's getting less money, and nobody really cares a whole lot about prophylaxis at this point. And Cutler's not beginning to show enough infection, so they close the study up, and they tell him to come home, and he leaves his equipment for the Guatemalas. So just to remind you to recap here in Guatemala then, the subjects are both men and women, and they are being given syphilis and other STDs. They were given penicillin, although not everyone is treated properly. In Alabama, the men already had the disease and were supposed to be in late latency, although not all of them were. And the men were supposed to be kept from treatment, although not all of them were as well. So that's just a way to keep the two apart a bit. So how do we even know about this? Because nothing was published. Cutler never published any of this work. There's one or two articles on the serology work that are in the Panamanian Journal, and they're in Spanish. So nothing in English gets published, and people don't know about the study. So he gave his papers to the University of Pittsburgh archives in 1990. Now, this man has 61 articles in PubMed. And he did research on lots of different things, and except for one small other um, collection that's in um, the National Library of Medicine. Nowhere else are his papers. <coughs> and I can't really explain. I have no evidence to explain why he gives them. I mean, it might be something as simple as they moved around a lot. They'd been in Pittsburgh for about 20 years at that point. Maybe Elise Cutler was cleaning the basement. And she says to her husband, you know, get this garbage out of our basement or, you know, give it somewhere or clean it up. Um, and that's my guess, really, about what happened um, and because it was never written up. And I think he was proud of the study and the work that they had done. So I'm in the archives, as I said, in Pittsburgh in 2003 to mostly look at the parent papers, and I find um, the material. And I'm really, I, I want to be clear about this, I was really shocked by the material, but I had not done the work on the numbers because there were just thousands of pieces of paper and lab reports, and there was no way for me to really understand how many of them were not treated. So I'm mainly reading the narrative of the, the reports. And I thought I would use it in my book. Um, and then by the time I got to the end of the book, and it just didn't fit, it didn't seem right. And I kept looking at my notes thinking, I got to know more about this. So when I finished the book on Tuskegee, and I didn't want the two of them confused, I went back to Pittsburgh in 2009, and I re-looked at the papers. I took much more careful notes. And I gave it at, a, um, at, a, at a, the American Association for the History of Medicine meeting. And Dr. Udell and I were laughing about this, because he and I had dinner together the night before, but then he left early because I was on the Sunday afternoon panel. And you know, if all of you have given papers on Sundays, no, everybody leaves, especially if you're at a place like Rochester, Minnesota, where you need two airplanes to get anywhere home. Um, so nobody went screaming out of the you know, history medicine meetings to the National Enquirer immediately, although people were shocked about what I was doing. And I wrote it up over the next, um, you know, and I had finished writing it up after the term ended, and I was going to give it, and I gave it to something called the Journal of Policy History, which is this really obscure history journal that I don't even read. But um, they asked me for something on Tuskegee, and I didn't want to write any more about Tuskegee, and they were doing a special issue on human subjects. So I said, okay, fine, I have this Guatemala material. So I wrote it up. Here's how it becomes worldwide news. Um, I had become really friends with a very interesting man named David Sensor, who the, was the longest um, running CDC director, and who plays a not good role in the Tuskegee story. So David is the director of CDC in 1969 when a decision, there's a meeting to see whether or not the study in Tuskegee should be closed. And Dave makes the decision as the CDC director to keep it going. And in fact, when the story of Tuskegee breaks in 72, he's burned in effigy by SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, outside the offices of the CDC. And I teased him once that had I been there, I would have been burning him. Um, and he said he understood that. But he had really come to think about how what the mistakes had been. And I sent him the copy mostly because he's an aging syphilologist, and I wanted the medical facts check because I was worried I'd gotten them wrong. He called me immediately, and mostly we just emailed each other. And he called me and he said, oh my god, this is horrible. CDC has to know about it. So remember, he knows what happens when stories like this get out before CDC can create an explanation or do anything about it. So he, he says, do you mind if I share it with people at CDC? And I said, I had no idea. I said, of course not. And I never thought it would go beyond CDC. I really didn't. Um, 
So CDC starts calling me, they, I send them all my papers, and then they send a man named John Douglas, who's their um, lead syphilologist, to Pittsburgh to look at the papers. And Douglas and his staff, because they're all epidemiologists, do what I was not trained to do and couldn't have done, which is to look at all the medical records and try to get them straight. And they could also afford to Xerox thousands of pages and bring them back to Atlanta. And Douglas writes a report that confirms my findings, and his report and my paper then start going up the chain of command. So it goes from CDC to NIH, and then it goes up to DHSS and the State Department, and then I find out in August that it's in the Domestic Policy Council of the White House, which I thought was pretty stunning. Um, so this is Censor. This is what he looked like in the 70s when he was, this was on the internet because um, he had been involved in the swine flu, um, the shot, getting people vaccinated for swine flu in the 70s, and people were really angry at him about it. He got fired, actually, from CDC for pushing for that because people got Guillain-Barre syndrome, or they, it was an assumption that were proven that the vaccine had caused Guillain-Barre. And this is what Dave looked like right before he passed away last year. So these are the people who were involved in the story. The man on the left, on the top, is Harold Jaffe, who some of you who've seen the film and the band plays on. He was one of the early HIV AIDS people at CDC. Harold is now the Associate Director for Science at CDC. The man on the bottom is John Douglas, who went to Pittsburgh. And the man on the right is Zeke Emanuel, as in brother of Rahm Emanuel, now the governor, I mean, the mayor of Chicago, but then Obama's chief of staff. And Zeke Emanuel is, was then the head of bioethics for NIH very interested in issues of exploitation, especially in the developing world. And I think that Emmanuel, who is a much, as you can well imagine, honed political sense better than mine, clearly, understood how this could be useful politically and what could happen here. So what happens is that what's orchestrated is that there's going to be an apology at the level of the federal uh, level. And it was pretty amazing because I'd been, you know, we had struggled all these years to get the apology for Tuskegee, and this was happening, frankly, in a matter of months. But I think they understood that this had to be happen before my paper formally came out. So uh, Secretary Clinton and Secretary Sebelius offer a formal apology on the morning of October 1st, 2010, and call it the study abhorrent, unethical, and reprehensible. President um, Obama called President Colomb in Guatemala, who calls it a crime against humanity. And then the president asked his commission on bioethical issues to investigate it more historically and to basically re-examine protections for human subjects. And that report, which is 200 pages long, is available at bioethics.gov. This is what the coverage looked like um, the next day in Guatemala. This is another Guatemalan paper. This is some of the cartoons that were in the Guatemala um, newspapers. So this is Uncle Sam looking in the mirror and seeing Mengele, the Nazi uh, war uh, criminal and physician who experimented and who died actually in, in Latin America. Um, this is a picture of Secretary Clinton apologizing to uh, President Colomb while the Guatemalan person is saying, look, you know, you may not know this, but we overthrew their government in 1954. We helped fund um, the murder of 200,000 peasants during um, the 80s. Um, we, um, the demand for drugs has made uh, Guatemala into pretty much a narco state at this point. Um, and there's lots of issues around immigration. So there are many things for the U.S. to apologize for in terms of Guatemala. It made the front page of the New York Times. Um, and the idea of, and then it went worldwide. So this is an example of a Dateline program in Australia that was made. And what's interesting about this one, other than I look so serious, is that the picture on the left is from one of the films about Tuskegee. So you get the linkage. So again, you see what I mean? Even though that's a blood draw, you would never know that. And it says, of course, on the top, infected. And so the gentleman in the middle who's lying down is one of the men who claimed he had been harmed by the study in Guatemala. The tombstone um, there in the picture was, I happened to be in speaking in Tuskegee when this guy came to interview me, so we filmed in the graveyard, you know, in Tuskegee, which is, I looked that worried because it was like 90 million degrees and there were fire ants. And um, <laughs> it was pretty uncomfortable. But the story, you can see how the linkage, I mean, this visually does what I'm trying to talk about, which is the way the stories get linked. So the feds put up this web page of what they were doing in the statements and all of that. This is the uh, report from the uh, Bioethics Commission that came out last September, and this is their report on protecting human subjects that followed. So I, in conclusion, I want to talk a little about the fact that it was, of course, not uncommon to use vulnerable populations at this point in time. 
<coughs> there had been infecting and inoculating studies before, and often media uproars when they happen. There's something about a sexually transmitted disease being given to people that has a particular kind of valence that's different than if it were a study on, I don't know, diabetes. It just has a different uh, feeling to it. The deception is also seen as normative in the, in, in the interest of science. And although there were beginning to be discussions about regulations, and you could argue, of course, the do no harm is, is there, um, there is a way in which um, there was sort of knowledge of ethical issues, but there certainly wasn't any IRB that Cutler had to go through. And it gets this enormous coverage. I mean, it went worldwide in about 30 seconds. And part of that's, of course, the web. But part of it is that the United States, as you know, despite what some of the Republican candidates have said, does not usually apologize to other countries for pretty much anything. And the details of this study are obviously horrendous and quite and involve sex. Um, the story fits this trope of a grade B horror movie <coughs> where <coughs> Excuse me. The intrepid explorer is now a historian, presumably, and the single doctor is seen as this monster. There is, of course, underlying mistrust about medical research and what happens, especially when it's combined with governmental power and done outside our borders. Um, and there is increasing concern about the fact that 85% of the drugs we now um, take are being tested primarily overseas. So the whole issue at the moment about exploitation and how we protect human subjects both in the US and elsewhere is on the political agenda. So what happened last year is the Bioethics Commission issues these two reports. The Guatemalan government issued its own report, which still hasn't been translated into English. Um, Cutler, Pittsburgh was only too happy to get rid of Cutler's papers, as you can well imagine. Um, and the National Archives now has them. So if you're interested, if you just either copy this URL or if you just um, Google Cutler Papers and National Archives, you'll get to the URL. And you can read everything that I read. And the Bioethics Commission also has hot links to their data, um, which is really terrific. And of course, the discussion about how we protect human subjects continues. Needless to say, not only did I call by all the media, I also got called by three tort attorneys. So of course, there's a lawsuit um, that's going forward at the moment um, that people are suing under something called the Alien Tort Statute of 1789. Um, but, and of course, the, the lawyers call it the Guatemalan Tuskegee. Um, the U.S. claims that the suit should be um, dismissed, and there's some agreement that some money to fight STDs are going to go to Guatemala, and there's more money being given to studies about rules and protection. And there's a debate going on right now about whether there should be any compensation to the individuals who were found in Guatemala who claim, make claims upon having survived this study. So I just have some um, final thoughts about the coverage. I think that it's really important to understand that Cutler and his colleagues thought they were doing good science against a dreadful disease, even when the Bioethics Commission has said that the science was really lousy. But I think it's really important to remember that that's what they thought. I mean, they didn't start out to do a bad study. They thought what they were doing was really important. I think it's dangerous if Cutler is the only one blamed here and is seen as a kind of lone gunman. Um, monster, and I think it's important to understand what structurally made it possible for this study to continue. I am concerned about the protections we have internationally. We also need to think, and I think this is where it gets even harder, is why would the Guatemalan state agree to this? And we have to really think about the pressures that are put on countries um, and areas that are under-resourced and how they have to get where money or help wherever they can. And it's the same issue, frankly, with the physician in Tuskegee who agreed to have the study done there. What happens when you don't have what um, Larry Langer, who writes on the Holocaust, calls it choiceless choice. What happens when the options are really lousy, basically, and you have to make some kind of decision. And then the question really becomes, how do we use these studies? How do we, tr how do we train researchers? Do we just need more regulations? Or do we really have to speak to um, what's um, going on with us? And I would argue in the end that what's important is not that you think that you couldn't be Cutler because you would never do something like this. But I think it's important to, for people to understand why there was so much passion around syphilis and why, in fact, you might actually be him. That where, how easy it is for people to get carried away with their own research and to not understand the consequences of what they're doing. So I'm open for questions. Thank you. Uh, I got it. Thank you. Yeah, I've got water. I'm fine. Thanks. 
Com Hi. Commendable body of work there, Thank Dr. You. Riverby. Uh, I, you sort of threw out that uh, Tuskegee has not influenced the African American decisions regarding uh, right. participation in clinical trials. What's the evidence for that? Um, a man named Ralph Katz, who's actually a research dentist um, at NYU, has done about 13 or 14 different studies. There, a lot of them are in a book called The Legacy of the Tuskegee, or the U.S. Public Health Service Study at Tuskegee, that just came out this last year that Ralph and a man named um, Reuben Warren, who's the director of the National Bioethics Center at Tuskegee, have edited together, and he has done all these things. And so what they think is that people know about the study, but it do, it's not what keeps people from research. And the original work that used the idea of this was actually done by Steve Thomas and Sandra Krauss Quinn, who run the Center for Minority Health at Maryland. And it was in APHA maybe 20 years ago now. And it was done on a small snowball sample of one church group in Atlanta. But it became a kind of explanation. And I think it gets used a lot by the research community as an explanation. And I think if you pushed a little harder, you'd find out that it really has more to do with if people are getting their health care in an ER or in a community hospital. They don't have contacts to um, clinical trials. There's, I mean, they're just much more complicated reasons than Tuskegee by itself. And if we just yeah, focus it's not on just Tuskegee, Tuskegee, right? It's but Tuskegee it's hard as to a say symbol. Tuskegee has nothing to do with. No, it. I, I didn't mean to say so, that, but so it's I, it's what it means. It's not that it's knowledge about the study. It's that it becomes this condensed symbol. Mm -hmm to explain a whole series of other issues. So I guess my corollary question is, well, uh, this revelation regarding what happened in Guatemala by you, will that affect Latino attitudes? Uh, you know, it's a very good question. You know, the thing is, we don't know. Um, I, I don't think so, because one of the things that's really interesting is, um, and maybe it's because it hasn't made the circuit yet. It'll be interesting to see this in maybe 10 years. So as more bio, what I think is going to happen is those of you who have taken the, you know, those online tests you have to do before you do research, where Tuskegee plays an important role. So my guess is that Guatemala is going to be added. So I call it the holy trinity of bioethics stories. So it's Jewish chronic disease hospital, cancer cells, Willowbrook with the ingesting and um, infecting of people with hepatitis. And then you get Tuskegee as the holy trinity of bad bioethics in the 60s and 70s. Guatemala is going to be the fourth point. So my guess is that it's going to be in the training in a couple of years, um, but it isn't there yet. And I don't know whether it'll be picked up be, um, by the Latino community. Um, it certainly has been important in Guatemala, um, that I know. But whether it'll be here or not or get taught, I think we'll have to you're going to have to ask me that question in 10 years, and then I might know the answer. Yes, ma'am. So I remember reading the Times story. And uh -huh. What one piece I remember is the framing of it around Nuremberg, and right. that this happened in parallel to right. U.S. Nuremberg. leading right. a very, you know, very right. righteous right. set of activities at Nuremberg. So, when you look at the original documents, right. is so is that historicism on our part, or were they in all? No, there's no mention of Nuremberg at all. And I think it's one of the things that makes, that's why the Time story does that, and a number of them did, is that that's what's so horrifying is our position. And I think that happens in part because in Jim Jones's book, Bad Blood, which is the first book on the Tuskegee story, Jim has a quote that's my favorite, frankly, of all of his books, because I think it's the most important. He's interviewing one of the physicians who ran the Tuskegee study, and he says to him, didn't Nuremberg give you pause? And the man says to him, they were Nazis. So the famous phrase from, the, from um, a, a, a wonderful bioethicist named Jay Katz, and Jay wrote an essay about Nuremberg, and he called it the code for barbarians. So the problem, I think, is both with Guatemala and Tuskegee worries me in the same way, that this will be like, oh, this is what racist or imperialist running dogs, you know, whatever your language wants to be, do this. And me, I, would, you know, I wouldn't do stuff like that. So I think we have to be really careful of the way we tell the story, or it's too easy to distance yourself in the same way that Cutler and there wasn't much knowledge about, frankly, what was going on in Nuremberg until the 60s anyway, even though it's just not getting discussed. And we know that from the historical record. So the discourse no, very little. No, 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 not really until the 60s. Hey, I'm um, just wondering if you could talk a little more about the um, current safeguards for protecting vulnerable subjects, human subjects, and prisoners uh, specifically. Right. Um, back in 2006, the uh, Institute of Medicine issued right. a report that um, you know, didn't really mandate necessarily anything, but it offered recommendations right. about protecting them, that they need to be, you know, given, you know, 
complete privacy and 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 autonomy and making the, right. the decisions but um but they also said that we, we can't just completely ban right. research on prisoners because that would be paternalistic because they may you know benefit from right. you know medical research and yet ethicists since then uh, uh, harriet washington specifically wrote in her book that prisoner research has sort of experienced a quiet resurgence right. since the 70s i'm wondering where you come down on that question yeah. of like you know, I'm still, Should prisoners be involved? Yeah, in I mean, I'm, I'm still, I mean, like, for example, the Bioethics Commission makes a big deal of the fact that there was informed consent in Terre Haute, and they compare that to what happened in Guatemala. And I'm not as convinced as they were because, as I think I said, the, the people in Terre Haute in the penitentiary were paid off by getting some more money, um, a little bit more money to buy food in the canteen, you know, at the, in the prison. They got cigarettes, which is what we always paid people off with in public health studies. And um, they got letters to their parole boards. So think about, you know, what that means. And I know the IOM report's idea was that one of the ways you get people, especially with HIV AIDS, to the state of care, best care, is in fact through these research trials sometimes. So it may be the only way to get it into the system. So I think that's why the IOM report um, claimed what it did. I I'm still uncomfortable about it. I think I have a kind of Jay Katzy kind of position about this. I just don't think there's a way in which they are informed consent. So I think the solution is better health care, you know, in the prison system, not research in the prison prison system that's going to be. Now, that's very, maybe incredibly naive and, you know, puts me in a position of taking a higher ground position that it's the structural problem of the medical care that's so horrific and is close to sometimes torture in our medical system, in our prison systems, than allowing people to be in research trials. So I've been trying to think about it. I wasn't convinced by the IOM report. And I, um, I'm not a big Harriet Washington fan, so I don't tend to trust a lot of her research because she gets things wrong. So that's a longer story. But um, I just don't trust her work. Um, so I don't know what her position. I haven't read the second book of hers. So OK. Um, I think. Where are we? First, oh, OK. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't see. I heard the voice. First of all, I see. applaud your research on yeah. both Tuskegee and the Guatemalan situation for bringing it to light. I think it's wonderful work that you've, you've put out here. Um, I read most of the Bioethics Commission report, and uh -huh. I was absolutely underwhelmed with it. Yeah. I saw a letter from the president asking for recommendations, and although the apology was given, there should be no. I'd like your response to what I'm thinking. Right. I, I, there's no issue about giving reparations. Of course, money should course, be given. Of course, absolutely, I agree with so, you. So I, I'm wondering where you stand on that, and I and I have a theory as well about this. Uh -huh. Having sat on two, well, an REB and an IRB. REB is it in Canada? When you see any person as less than human, right this kind of thing can happen. Absolutely. And you can have as many checklists as you want. I've That's seen right. all the checklists required. You can do as many studies as you want about research protections. But fundamentally, when you come down to it, it seems to me if anybody is seen as less than another human being, That's this right. will happen. And that stuff is not in the Bioethics right. Commission report. Well, and there's the, no. Yeah, in the moral science in the second one, I don't know if you read the second one started, too. I haven't. Yeah, they, they talk more about it, and they actually had hearings. You can go read the transcripts of their meetings. Um, they had hearings about um, in the meeting in Boston last spring. They had meetings last spring or last fall. They had meetings about compensation, and they had someone come from the University of Washington where there is a compensation system in the university for anything that goes wrong in research trials. So I think that's the next big step around thinking about this. And I, uh, I, my guess is I have no inside information on this, so this is me just guessing here. My guess is that they'll probably pay these people off in, you know, in Guatemala, some just the way they settled the Tuskegee lawsuit out of court um, and gave the men very little money, but it got settled. Um, and then there'll be some money given to the Guatemalan state to do research or something, and that'll be the end of it. Um, but I think setting up a compensation system is really important. And I, some of the people in the Bioethics Commission were there, but you know they were just you know it's a political. It was just they were careful, you know. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned that 85 percent of current drugs are tested overseas. overseas. Yes. And so my question is, what protections are in place today <coughs> for 
for that kind of testing, right. and is that being done in under-resourced populations? A lot and, of it is, and what's called, um, you want people who are what's called therapeutically naive, that is, if you're going to test a drug, you don't want people taking the way, you know, most of us are taking statins and a bunch of other things. You're interested in finding a population that, so you don't have to know about, at least in the beginning, about drug interaction. Um, and then there are other people who think people are going overseas in part because it's cheaper and because you can get a bigger population to recruit, and of course, presumably, some of the rules um, are not as stringent. If your drug is approved by the FDA, then it has to have gone through an IRB, and there's, you know, these new rules that Zeke Emanuel has been part of, he and Jerry Menikoff at the Office for Human Subject Protection are trying to tweak a bit about whether or not we have, I don't know if the new ones, they're still debating this, um, whether there'll be one super IRB, so you don't have to go through five or six different places. Um, but as you know, as the woman sitting next to you said, I think that that's right, that it's about what in the, it's how you see the subjects. Do you see them as people you can just recruit because you can get them, or do you really see yourself as being them? And therefore, what's, what's in the heart in some ways? I mean, the, I think what's important is what we teach medical students and, and public health researchers about how to see um, other people. I think it, it speaks to the need for diversity in the classrooms so that people hear it. Because I, I, I asked Dave Sensor, actually, why in 1969 did you not end it? You know, it would, and think about it. If he had ended it in 1969, we probably wouldn't know anything about it because there wouldn't have been a lawsuit. There probably wouldn't have been the presidential, um, the Senate hearings on it. There wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't have been a commission to look at it. N none of that would have happened because the study would have just disappeared unless some historian found it one day. Um, and Jones, Jim Jones, who wrote Bad Blood, had found it before um, the story broke in 72, but he thought it was ended. So, you know, he would have never picked it up. He didn't know it was still ongoing. So there's all of those things that I think we just can't know. But I think it's about trying to teach people to think differently about how you do research and what, what matters and doesn't. And I think that's hard in the face of the kinds of pressures that are people to publish, to keep their big labs going, um, to look for money where they can, especially as we see the increasing corporatization of both public health schools and medical schools. I mean, I was just at Stanford about a month ago, and I just couldn't get over. It looked like a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Silicon Valley. You know, it was like the Bill Gates Computing Center and the Paul Allen this. And, you know, you just wonder about what kind of pressures are under, people are under in those circumstances, even if they mean well. It's not I'm suggesting that people sell out for simple reasons. I think it's that they don't even know they're doing something wrong. Okay, let me just get this off here. Hold on. Okay. Okay, yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering, I wanted to go back to Tuskegee for a moment. Sure. And um, I was just curious how you process um, the power of your voice as an outsider uh -huh. writing about um, this community and also kind of, you know, how, what does it mean to, con your voice to construct part yeah. of the, the history of the It's narrative. been very, I've thought a lot about it and part of the way that I try to stay honest is I, I have, um, I did it more like an anthropologist than a, um, a historian, that is, I made contacts down there. I worked with people in this. Um, the book is framed by um, what happened in the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church down there. So, you know, I've made contacts within the community. I'm very aware, being a northern white woman, I'm not from there. Um, I'm never going to be from there, even though I keep teasing about my husband that we're going to go back there. But, um, you know, it's not going to happen. I'm very aware of that. Um, so I think there are limitations. I'll never understand it in the deep way that people do. I, I supervised a dissertation of a woman who teaches at Tuskegee named Muja Shakur, who did a really nice dissertation on sort of the impact of the study on the families. So I think there are people in the community who can do that kind of work. I think the bio, the community center that's trying to be built at Shiloh will be a good memorial to them. I think there are things that announce, I think I can speak more to the research community. I can't obviously be the voice of the men there. They have their own. And I, the only thing I tried to do is like I made sure there were no abject black men pictures in my book. This is why I like the cover picture because I thought it looked like the shootout, the OK Corral. And I really liked the picture of them all standing up like that. And um, I knew some of the men before they passed. And you know, I was very moved by them, but I'm very aware of being an outsider um, and the limitations of what that means. So I think it's a totally reasonable question to ask. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I was intrigued by uh, your slide just, uh, that, that noted about Cutler yeah. possibly being the, uh, the lone wolf, the, yeah. the sole actor. Right. And, and, and I think about whether or not corporate public health uh, in the United States 
has uh, from that community whether there's been a sufficient uh, or any uh, expression of revulsion for what your study and right. others uh, that uh, have, pointed, have pointed out for this kind of activity. Uh, and we seem, uh, to, for example, Thomas Perrin who was the yeah. Surgeon General at this right. time, and anybody believes that John Cutler was doing anything without uh, Perrin's oh, facilitation, not. approval, right. and all the rest of it. Absolutely. And so not. what happens in 2012, we continue to give the Thomas Perrin Award for Excellence in right. uh, STD programs in the United States. That's right. Uh, we, right. I think there may even be a Thomas Perrin Lecture and there may even be a school of public health named in Thomas Perrin. There is a Tom, it's very interesting. In 2006, because of, quote, community sensibilities, the, the money that the family, Cutler's family, had given for the, his lecture in sexual health got taken away at the University of Pittsburgh, but the main building of the public health school is still called Perrin Hall. So it makes your point. Um, yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for sure. um, the research that you did and for publicizing it and, yeah. and well, coming thank here. David. Really thank David Sensor. May he rest in peace. Because really, oh. I think I, I mean it's Dave who really understood. And frankly, you know, it wouldn't have happened without his authority. And people really respected him. The, he's really interested in history. They named the the, uh, the CDC museum is named after him now. Um, so I think it was that he had so much. I mean, I'm not trying to be totally self-effacing here, but I think it's that Dave's authority really carried. And so one of the things that's interesting to think about is in 2003, I didn't know him. It was the Bush administration. So if I had tried to write this up when I first found the material, I'm not sure it would have gone any. I think it would have just been another horror story in medical history, which is sort of what I thought it was. I mean, I never in my wildest dreams expected that this was going to happen. I remember when they called me and said it was going to be there. So anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted your question. Oh, no. Uh, anyway, my question is, you mentioned, uh, you know, do we need to have some type of international standard for studies that are conducted in, in other countries? And I'm just wondering uh, where WHO stands on that. Is there any movement to try to get some type of... Uh, well, there know, already are international standards. There's just a huge debate going on about what kind. And some people have argued, like the IO, if you go back to your question about the IOM report on prisoners, I heard a great quote, one bioethicist told me a quote about someone in an under-resourced area who said, you know, bioethics will kill us because it's the only way to get resources into their country. So do you say to Pfizer, no, please don't come, when it's the only way? So are we going to start saying, there should be rules that say for X amount of time, if you test X drug, you then have to keep treating everybody who's in the study. Who's going to, if we're fighting over whether or not, you know, there can be an individual mandate in our own country for insurance, how are we going to say to a capitalist drug company that we should, you should give away your drug for nothing once you test it? So I think those debates are still very much a part of how we think about this internationally. And where this goes, I just don't think we know yet. I mean, there certainly are rules in place, but how they're going to really get enforced is another story. There's somebody back there, Dave. Um, One more question. Okay. Um, as someone who sits on an IRB, I may be biased toward thinking bureaucracy can have value. Right. Um, but as a researcher, I also know, and, and talking with researchers, Researchers are in love with their research. Of course they are. They know more about it. what they're doing than anybody else does. They think they know how it's going to come out. They know that it's incredibly important. That's right. And I, I think it's important to work on educating them and ethical issues. Right. But really, they're never, I, I am never going to be willing to say that a researcher will be able to judge the ethics of her own study. Right. And, and to me, that's why right. I, I've come to believe that the bureaucratic structure of saying right. some independent body has to take a right. look at it right. I mean, the question, is actually really, really essential. I, I don't disagree with you. I, I think we need both. So I think you have a sort of you know, worry about the checklist. But it's also true that, I mean, it's, I, mean I said to Dave Sensor, why the hell didn't you change your mind in 69? And there was one man um, named Gene Stolerman, who's an internist, um, who was then at the University of Tennessee. And Stolerman was on the committee. He's the only one on the committee who said, oh my god, this is going to be a disaster if this gets out. You have to stop this. Um, but nobody else did. And Dave finally said to me, look, there was no, it was, we were all white male docs. 
So I think if somebody else had been there who had said, are you kidding me? This is still going, you know, and we're talking about 1969. I mean, Martin Luther King's dead one year at this point. So um, I think that that made a big difference. And I think the IRBs help. I think what, what I'm hoping that some of the new rules will make it slightly less bureaucratic so that people don't see the IRB as something that gets in their way rather than something that actually can be useful to them and to protect, then in the end it protects them from their passion. And I, I'm giving a talk in two weeks about doctors and their passions because I think, and all of us do it, and it speaks to the question you raised about my own work, that is, did I understand, you know, do you even understand what you're walking into, what impact it had? I mean, I didn't have to go through an IRB and there are real issues about the book and what I raised and I'm very aware of that as well. And there were, I mean, what kept me in check was having people in the community to, to check. And I just kept checking back with them. So I sort of set up a kind of community-based IRB for myself. Um, so that, like, when I had to make certain decisions, like, for example, the men's medical records are all public now, and they've all died. So you can use their names. I, and, and their names are out there, and everybody knows who they are. But I didn't want the details of the medical records if they hadn't been public. So I made a decision that if the if they they weren't public about their role in it in some really big way, like Mr. Shaw, for example, or Mr. Pollard, who was the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit, what I did was that I I gave them a made-up name in the book, but I put a footnote to the actual record number so that a historian could track me. So I was doing the right thing for my profession, but I was protecting people's names if they didn't want to be public. So it's stuff like that that I think matters. So thank. You. Oh, one more question. Do we have time for one more? Sure. Okay. You have to do it with the mic because I've got eight, I've got stuff up here. Um, so many comments. So why wouldn't you have needed IRB approval for what you did? Uh, Which was good, but why did you need I, IRB no, approval? I, I, in retrospect, I should have, but I was a historian, so I got a pass. But you, but you interviewed the families? I did, and I got a pass. The Wellesley IRB did not require me to, historians sometimes get passes. We're kind of that, and that's part of what the debate is right now. And when I was a graduate student, I had money from the National Center for Health Services Research for my dissertation, and I had to go through the IRB for the oral histories. And I said, they said, they said where's your questionnaire? I said, I'm doing oral history. You don't use a questionnaire when you do oral history. They said, no, 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 you need a questionnaire. So I wrote a questionnaire. I handed it to the IRB. I got approval. Nobody ever checked. I never used the questionnaire. I had a typical kind of historian's experience with the IRB. The, the other comment I would have is that there may be some research we can't do. I mean, right. I think it's, I don't have, I'm not an academic, so I, I can't document it, but I can certainly see the trend to go to other countries when we can't get people in our own countries that are even willing to do the studies. I've read some studies and said, I'm not putting my kid in that kind of study. Exactly. And then you turn around and you find it's being done in a developing country. That's right. So maybe there is some research that and some drugs done. that will have to be looked at differently. And, right. and that is because because we determine that we can't treat people that's in right. that way. That's right. I think that that's absolutely right. Maybe that's a good place to end. Thank you very much. Thank you.